thinking about the world uh, today, uh, I think it's extremely interesting to think not only about the past, but how we have reached the current situation. And I think we couldn't find uh, a most distinguished uh, thinker uh, than Odette Galore, one of uh, my profession economics greatest thinkers. Uh, Odette Galore is professor of economics at Brown University. And Odette has been a pioneer uh, in the development of unified growth theory. Odette did another great service uh, to economics, uh, I think, uh, writing a book uh, called The Journey of Humanity, which in some sense is a synopsis not only of his work, but also of the many researchers that has followed his paradigm to think boldly about big ideas and how uh, we can think about the past and the future of humanity. So my book, The Journey of Humanity, is an attempt to explore the evolution of human societies since uh, the emergence of anatomically modern human in Africa nearly 300,000 years ago. In fact, much of it surrounds two of what I will define as the most fundamental mysteries that surrounds the growth process. The first mystery will be defined as the mystery of growth, namely, what are the roots of this dramatic transformation in living standards that occurred in the past two centuries after literally hundreds of thousands of years of stagnation? And the second mystery is the mystery of inequality, namely, what is the origin of this vast inequality in the wealth of nations? Now, over most of human existence, human life to a large extent was nasty, brutish and short. In fact, human life was remarkably similar to that of other species on planet Earth. Humans were preoccupied by survival and reproduction. Living standards were very close to the subsistence level. And living conditions, broadly speaking, did not differ greatly across time and across space. In fact, if you think about the world only a few centuries ago, it is a world in which one force of newborn did not reach their first birthday, and one half of them did not reach their reproductive age. It is a world in which about one tenth of women perish in each single childbirth. It was a world in which life expectancy fluctuated in a very narrow range of 25 to 40 and rarely exceeded 40. And perhaps most remarkably, it was a world in which an economic crisis did not lead into belt tightening, but rather to mass starvation and ultimately extinction. But then, in the past two centuries, we see this incredible metamorphosis. We see an incredible transformation in living standards across the globe. World income per capita increases by a factor of 14. Life expectancy has more than doubled. And a great divergence took place across time and across space. Now, to illustrate this metamorphosis, consider for a moment residents of Jerusalem at the time of Jesus, 2,000 years ago. Roman Jerusalem and whisk them in a time machine forward to Ottoman rule, Jer rule Jerusalem at the beginning of the 19th century. So this will be a nearly 2,000 year jump forward. Despite this jump that is quite significant, these individuals will be able to adjust instantaneously to the new environment. Past knowledge would be largely applicable. Technological improvements would be merely incremental and would permit instantaneous adaptation. Occupations would require very similar skills. And importantly, life expectancy would not change. And as a result of it would not require a change in the individual mindset, would not require future-oriented mindset. But now, consider these individuals and whisk them again in time this time only 200 years forward, from Ottoman rule Jerusalem at the beginning of the 19th century to Jerusalem of today. 
Despite this modest jump in time, this will be a shocking experience, a devastating experience. Now, in contrast to some conventional wisdom, it is important to note that living standards has not evolved gradually in the course of human history. Technology evolved gradually in the, in, in the course of human history, but it was converted into more people rather than more prosperous people. And as a result of it, what we see in the course of the past 200 years is a metamorphosis that is associated with what I will define as a phase transition, namely a change in the structure of the system once a tipping point has been reached. And this change is ultimately generating this dramatic increase in living standards. Now, given what I just suggested, it is important to understand the process of development as a whole in order to understand the roots of inequality as we see it today. And consequently, what I would like to do at the moment is to think about the process of development in its entirety. Namely, the evolution of human societies since the emergence of Homo sapiens in Africa nearly 300,000 years ago till the present. Now, when you think about the process of development, you can divide the process of development into three fundamental phases. The first one will be defined as the Malthusian epoch. The second one is the post-Malthusian regime. And the third one is the one that is familiar to us is the modern growth regime. Now, the Malthusian epoch originates with the emergence of Homo sapiens in Africa nearly 300,000 years ago. And it spends 99.9% .9 of human existence. It ends in the eve of industrialization in the context of the most advanced societies in the world. What is unique about the Malthusian epoch is that this is an epoch of stagnation in income per capita but at the same time, this is an epoch of dynamism in terms of technology, population, and human adaptation. And it is this dynamism that ultimately, after 300,000 year period, is bringing about this takeoff initially into the post-Malthusian regime, and ultimately, in the aftermath of the demographic transition, it brings about the so-called modern growth regime. So it is critical, in fact, to understand the forces that operated during the Malthusian epoch. These are the forces that ultimately led into the differential timing of the transition from stagnation to growth and to much of the inequality as we see it today. So as I said earlier, the Malthusian epoch is characterized by this important dualism, stagnation along with dynamism. So in the context of stagnation, stagnation occurs in living standards. Income per capita, as I said before, fluctuated around the subsistence level of consumption. Life expectancy fluctuated in, in a very narrow range of 25 to 40, and rarely exceeded 40. But at the same time, this is a period of dynamism. And the dynamism occurs in technology, the dynamism occurs in population, and the dynamism occurred in the context of human adaptation to the technological environment and to the geographical environment. Now, at any point in time, what I define as dynamism is nearly negligible. It's very small. Technological progress advances at a very, very slow pace. We move from one stone tool technology to another stone tool technology over thousands of years. But over 300,000 year period, these little small increments are resulting in an enormous space of technological progress. So we move from stone tool technologies 300,000 years ago to steam engine technologies in the midst of industrialization or in the eve of industrialization. We move from population in the world of about two and a half million in the eve of the agricultural revolution 12,000 years ago to about one billion people in the midst of industrialization. 400 fold increase in the size of the human population despite Malthusian stagnation. 
And at the same time, we see great adaptation of the human population. And it is these three forces, technological progress, population growth, and human adaptation, that are ultimately the wheels of change. They are the forces that are governing the pace of the transition from stagnation to growth. They are the dynamic forces that ultimately trigger the transition from stagnation to growth. So given their importance, it is important to realize how each force in, in turn affected other forces that operated during this time period. And the first element that is very important to note during the, this Malthusian dynamism is the impact of technological progress on the scale of the population. So this was a time period in which technological progress, as it is today, increased income per capita but only temporarily. Why? Because, in fact, the increase in income per capita permitted more children to survive, more of them to be born, and as a result of it, population growth counterbalanced the growth of technology, and income per capita inevitably reverted back to the previous equilibrium position. The second one has to do with the impact of technology on human adaptation. So as I said before, the Malthusian pressure affected the size of the human population. Better technology permitted larger population to be supported. But in fact, it affected the composition of the human population as well. Namely, it generated certain adaptations of humans to the technological environment and to the geographical environment. And the third element has to do with the origins of technological progress. Naturally, technological progress was not manna from heaven. It was affected by the size of the population, the potential number of innovators, the demand for innovators, and at the same time, the composition of the population, how adapted people are to the technological environment. So what we see in the course of human history is the rotation of the wheels of change. And during the Malthusian epoch, it is the time period in which the size of the population and the composition of the population are affecting technological progress. But in turn, technological progress permits larger population to be sustained and permits greater adaptation of the human population to the technological environment. So in the course of human history, we see this reinforcing mechanism between technology and the size and the composition of the population. And this implies that over time, as I said earlier, technological progress becomes more and more rapid. And ultimately, it reaches a critical point, a tipping point. When this critical point is being reached, the environment is changing so rapidly that in order to cope with this rapidly changing technological environment, people must invest in themselves. They must invest in their education in order to learn how to navigate this stormy technological environment. Responsible parents start to invest in the education of their kids. But naturally, investment in education is not a free lunch. It must come on the account of other elements in the budgets of these individuals. These individuals live very close to the subsistence level. So they cannot economize on their own consumption. The only other item that they can economize on is the number of children. So the rise in human capital formation that is triggered by the acceleration in technological progress is generating human capital formation and a reduction in fertility. This implies that the Malthusian forces suddenly vanish in the sense that it is no longer the case that technological progress is being counterbalanced by population growth because, in fact, population growth starts to decline. So what we see here, to a large extent, is what is defined in sciences as a phase transition. And think about the phase transition that is familiar to all of us in nature, namely the transition from water to gas. What we see in the course of human history is that technological progress starts to evolve more and more rapidly. And once it reaches a critical point, investment in human capital starts to take place, education becomes very massive and very extensive, 
reduction in fertility takes place and we see the phase transition, the transition from the Malthusian epoch into the modern growth regime. So to a large extent, the roots of global inequality has to do, as I said, with this differential transition from stagnation to growth that occurred in the past two centuries. Now, so if we think about inequality today, we ask ourselves, what are the roots of this inequality? It is tempting to think that, in fact, this inequality is related to cross-country differences in education, in physical capital formation, and in technological levels, namely the proximate causes of uneven development. But then, of course, the question is, why is it the case that some societies fail to efficiently invest in education and in machines? Why is it the case that some societies fail to, adv to adopt advanced technologies? And this brings us into the most fundamental questions, what are in fact the historical and the prehistorical barriers in the process of development? Namely, what are the deep-rooted factors behind the roots of inequality as we see it today? And this will bring us into the ultimate forces, namely the role of geography and the role of human diversity, as I will explain momentarily. So broadly speaking, when you think about the fingerprints of institutions, this is not the most primitive element that one should consider. Institutions are very important, but typically they have underlying forces, geographical forces, and as you will see momentarily, human diversity as well. So as we peel gradually the different layers of influence on the roots of inequality today, we can move back from into the understanding of what I will define as the cultural factor, namely the emergence of differential cultural traits in different regions across the globe. But what we see in the course of human history is the emergence of growth enhancing traits, social capital in some regions of the world, and the emergence of growth retarding traits, such as say family ties in other regions of the world. And this was invoked for instance to explain the divide between northern Italy and southern Italy. A country that is naturally having similar institutions, but nevertheless, divergence in cultural traits is leading into divergence in economic prosperity. But again, typically, cultural traits are not manna from heaven. Naturally, social capital did not emerge out of the blue in northern Italy, and family ties did not emerge out of the blue in southern, the southern part of Italy. There are, of course, instances in which we see random growth-enhancing cultural mutations, if you wish, that are persisting over time. And perhaps the best example is in the context of Judaism. In the first century CE, certain sages are imposing the demand that Jewish boys must, be, must learn how to recite the Bible and stand in front of the community by the age of, of 13. It has no economic justification whatsoever. It is entirely capricious at the time. But nevertheless, this cultural mutation persists over time because ultimately human capital, education, became highly rewarded in occupations that emerge over time, particularly in the urban sector. But as I said, cultural traits largely evolved gradually in the process of development. They evolved and they adapted to the economic environment, to the technological environment, and to the geographical environment. So this leads us to, to take a step back to understand how, in fact, culture and geography emerge in the first place. If you wish, it leads us into the exploration of the long shadow of geography. So as I said, geographical characteristics such as soil quality, climate, the disease environment, and even geographical isolation, had an indirect effect okay, on the evolution of cultural characteristics and the evolution of institutional characteristics. And these elements ultimately persisted and generated some of the inequality that we see across the globe. 
So it is primarily geographical characteristics that are operating through institutional and cultural characteristics that are affecting inequality as we see across the globe today. Now, if we think about geography and we try to peel the different layers of influence, we are led ultimately into the onset of the agricultural revolution 12,000 years ago. So the agricultural revolution, or the Neolithic revolution if you wish, is in fact the transition of societies from hunter-gatherer tribes to agricultural communities. And this transition is associated with the emergence of a non-food producing class. And this non-food producing class is ultimately engaged in knowledge creation, in the form of science, in the form of technology, and in the form of written languages. And this knowledge creation is generating a technological head start that persists over time. And according to Jared Diamond, in his influential thesis about the Neolithic Revolution and comparative development, the variation in the timing of the Neolithic Revolution across the globe explain much of the variation in global inequality today. Namely, the fact that some societies transition into the Neolithic earlier than others implies that those societies are more prosperous today because of this technological head start that persisted over time. The evidence, unfortunately, are not very complementary to this thesis. So the evidence shows something very, very striking. In the past, in the Middle Ages, the diamond hypothesis is very important for the understanding of comparative development. Namely, technological head starts explain much of the variation in inequality across the globe till the year 1500. But today, in fact, it has no impact for the simple reason that the Neolithic Revolution had a dual effect on economic prosperity. On the one hand, the diamond argument, namely a technological head start that persisted over time, and that's very important. But on the other hand, we see the emergence of comparative advantage in agriculture. And comparative advantage in agriculture in an era of globali globalization that emerges in the post-1500 period is a liability because there are limited technological spillover from agriculture and there, are limited, uh, there is a limited demand for human capital. So ultimately, the two forces are counterbalancing one another and in the present day, the Neolithic Revolution has no explanatory power of the variations in income per capita across the globe. So we march all the way back to the onset of the Neolithic Revolution. But in fact, in order to understand global inequality today, we will have to march back all the way to Africa, from where we all originated. And what happens is that during the migration of anatomically modern human from Africa, 60 to 90,000 years ago, the migration was such that the composition of population diversity across the globe was affected in a persistent way and ultimately comparative development or inequality as we see it today was affected in a very significant way. So let me explain the argument. So during the exodus of anatomically modern human from Africa, departing populations carried with them only a subset of the degree of diversity that existed in the parental colonies. And this diversity can be cultural, phenotypic, behavioral, or linguistic. Now, migration at the time was sequential. And as a result of it, what we see in the data is that there is low level of diversity at greater migratory distance from Africa. And this is known as the serial founder effect. It is important because diversity has conflicting effects on productivity. On the one hand, Diversity has beneficial effects on creativity and innovations. Namely, it generates cross-fertilization of ideas, complementarities in the production process, and this is beneficial for innovations. But on the other hand, diversity is associated with social non-cohesiveness. Generate mistrust. It generates disagreement about the desirable public goods the amount of investment in education, the amount of investment in health, or just political division. And consequently, it is associated with conflicts. And this implies that if, in fact, 
there are positive and diminishing effects of diversity on innovations, and there are positive and diminishing effects of homogeneity on social cohesiveness, one should expect a hump-shaped relationship between migratory distance from Africa or diversity and economic productivity. And this is precisely what the data is showing us. If you focus on panel B, for instance, this is the world in the year 1500. This is, in fact, data about urbanization. And as you can see, there is an intermediate level of diversity that maximizes productivity. And it's very significant in terms of the economic impact of it. If you look at panel C, this is today's world. Okay? Again, hump-shaped relationship. So in the year 1500, the optimally diverse societies were societies such as Korea, Japan, and China. Societies that we hardly identify with optimally diverse societies. But the name of the game in 1500 was very different. This is a time period in which technological progress is not very rapid, and as a result of it, the benefits of homogeneity in terms of, of social cohesiveness is much more important than the potential adverse effect on innovativeness. But as you move to panel C, which is today's world, in fact, the optimal level of diversity is associated with a society like the US society namely society that is significantly more diverse. So as we move into a more challenging technological environment, cultural fluidity, diversity, is very important in permitting individuals to navigate this stormy technology, stormy technological environment, and consequently uh, um, the level of diversity is uh, increasing, the optimal level of diversity is increasing over time. And if we project into the future, this implies that since we are moving into a more and more demanding technological environment, societies that are increasingly more diverse will, will have the upper hand in terms of productivity.